Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et à toutes à la conférence de Christian Kaisers. Christian est, a étudié les neurones miroirs qui traitent les actions des autres avec Giacomo Rizzolati. Avec... Est-ce que Christian, est-ce que Valeria est là? Eh, oui, elle est là, mais, mais pas, euh, pas dans la même chambre. D'accord, donc elle ne veut pas fa faire partie de, du Zoom. Eh, non, pas aujourd'hui, non. D'accord. Alors, euh, Christian a construit le Social Brain Lab à Groningen. Comment on dit Groningen? Groningen? <rire> oui, non, c'est un, un bon effort. OK. Euh, où leurs travaux de l'IRMF humaines ont montré que les participants activent leurs propres actions, émotions et sensations tout en étant témoins de celles des autres. Ce marqueur neural de l'empathie est réduit chez les patients atteints de psychopathie. Depuis 2010, Christian dirige l'effort de neurosciences euh, euh, sociales comparatives au Social Brain Lab Institut néerlandais des neurosciences à Amsterdam, où il étudie la base neurale de l'empathie et de la prosocialité entre les espèces. Et ainsi, son titre est, de sa, son, son exposé est « Base neurale de l'empathie et de la prosocialité entre les espèces. Everybody stop worrying, the talk will be given in English. » And the title is Neural Basis of Empathy and Prosociality Across Species. And I am very happy to welcome to Montreal virtually Christian Kaisers. Eh bien, merci beaucoup pour l'introduction. And uh, I'll switch to, to, to English now. Well, thank you for, for having me. It's really a pleasure to, to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. I think uh, it's a, a somewhat unusual audience for me. I believe there's a, a lot of um, members in the audience with more computational backgrounds. So what I'd like you to, to do, if that's okay, if there are any questions at any point, just unmute your, your microphone and then uh, ask away. I think uh, even if I don't get to the end of my presentation, uh, that's, uh, that's not a big loss if we can uh, have a, a dialogue. Just you know, Now, practice interrupting. <laughs> This is a practice. Uh, just so that you should know that a lot of the prior talks, if you haven't seen them, have been in uh, also in social robotics. And the question has come up many times of what you're going to discuss, but not from a physiological point of view. Okay, that's, uh, that's nice. Now, the big question that fascinates me in, in my lab, and that includes a, a lot of work of Valeria Gazzola as well, is why is it and how is it that the actions and the emotions of others affect us so much? So if you have a look at this uh, Ukrainian boy, for instance, that just uh, lost his family, if you look at his gaping mouth, at his tears, at his desperate facial expression, I think most of you will feel not only a deep sense of distress that you share with this boy, but you perhaps also feel a certain longing to try to do something for this boy. And the question we have is why is it in a way that when we witness the state of others, we don't just um, cognitively understand what they go through, but we share really their actions and their emotions and we start to feel this urge to do something for them in certain situations. Now, what I'd like to do with you in this talk is first have a, a section where I look more at um, what happens while we perceive the actions of others. And uh, I'll try to ask a, a bit as well, how could we imagine that we come to have mirror neurons? Then I'll switch to the more emotional aspect that is so salient in, in, in the experience we have when we see this Ukrainian boy, which is the question of how we share the emotions of others. And uh, I look at that in both humans and in uh, animals. And then I'll ask whether there is a relationship between the degree and the mechanism through which you share the emotions of others and a willingness to, to really be pro-social and do something to help others. And at the end, if we get there, I'll uh, discuss briefly as well whether empathy is something that just happens to us or whether it is something that we actively control. 
Now let's start with action. Now, as uh, many of you know, and uh, as uh, Stephen uh, also introduced, uh, our early work was looking at actions. And what we were doing was that we were recording from uh, neurons in the premotor cortex uh, of the macaque. And uh, of course, if you record from the premotor cortex of the macaque, you'll find a lot of neurons that respond when the monkey himself is doing something. But the interesting finding was that uh, a proportion of them, let's say about 10%, were also responding while the monkey wasn't doing anything, but was seeing me perform similar actions, either with the hand or with the mouth. And many of you have seen mirrors, uh, mirror neuron kind of videos. Uh, I'll show you one reconstruction of a, a neuron that I was recording. So you'll first see uh, the, the monkey grasp a piece of food, you'll hear the motor discharge of the neuron, and then afterwards the same neuron will be activated by seeing me grasp with the hand or with the mouth. It's the motor discharge, and here during observation, and here during observation again. Now, what was uh, interesting to us in these neurons was that they were suggesting that the brain is really wired in a way to map the actions of others onto the very neurons we use for our own actions. Now, of course, uh, not all of us are interested in monkeys, so we did similar experiments in humans by putting people in the scanner and have them, for instance, uh, perform actions like uh, scooping soup out of a bowl, we can then map the brain regions involved in performing our own actions here in red. Then we can show them others perform similar actions, like grasping a glass. And what we observed was an overlap of the two activities in the brain in these regions that I show here in white. Uh, that showed at the level of brain region something similar to what we could really relate to individual neurons in the monkey. And that included the premotor regions we had been looking at in the monkey, as well as somatosensory and uh, parietal regions and some visual and cerebellar regions here as well. So what this was showing us was that the fact that monkeys and humans seem to be wired to really share the, the actions of others. Now, how about sound? So uh, I remember once um, before an, uh, a talk I was giving at a conference, I was trying to fall asleep in my hotel room and I was starting to hear a rhythmic squeak coming from the hotel room next door. And the squeaking was accelerating, accelerating and ending in one big loud final squeak. But the thing that was keeping me awake wasn't so much the squeaking, but this very vivid understanding I had what was actually happening in the room next door. So we were wondering what happens when you don't hear, when you don't just see actions, but you hear them. And so the first thing we did was in monkeys, we tried to find neurons that were performing actions that actually produce a sound. So for instance, here we have a neuron that responds when the monkey is breaking a peanut. That works also if we give them a, a rubber peanut, so it's not because the monkey hears itself uh, perform the action, it's really the motor cortex doing it. And then we stood in front of the monkey and performed similar actions in front of him, either by combining vision and sound, so that we stand in front of the monkey and we broke the peanut uh, while playing back the sound of peanut breaking, but we could also just do a mute version without sound or actually just present the sound without doing anything. And the observation that we had was that a neuron like this one that was prepare, preferring peanut breaking when the monkey was doing it over another action like uh, grasping uh, a little squeaking duck had a similar preference and also, while the monkey was seeing and hearing us do these actions, just seeing or just hearing, suggesting that these neurons don't just map the vision of the action onto the motor program, but as well just uh, the sound of the action when performed by someone else. And if we use um, a classifier on the neural activity, in all of these cases, from the firing of just a single neuron, 
we could tell what action the monkey was perceiving others do here. Now, how about humans? So in humans, we, then, we of course don't have access to individual neurons to test this fine-grained selectivity. But what we can uh, leverage is the fact that certain parts of our brain are more involved in hand actions, other parts are more involved in mouth actions. So then we put people in the scanner and we presented them sounds of either mouth actions, and they sounded a bit like this, or hand actions, and they sound a bit like this. And then we had them perform similar actions in the scanner themselves. Now, from um, the, the runs where they perform actions themselves, we could isolate parts of the brain, here shown in red and in yellow, that have a preference, a motor preference. So the dorsal one is responding more when participants themselves do things with their hand, and the ventral one respond more when participants themselves do things with the mouth. The interesting thing was that when we just present the sounds, we have the same effect. So the hand motor cortex responds to hearing these hand sounds and vice versa for the mouth, telling us that the brain really maps the actions of others onto the brain uh, subregion we would use to achieve similar actions. Now, if we put all of that into a simple model of the brain, what we basically see is that while you witness the actions of others, you first uh, encode that in parts of the brain that represent kind of what you see and what you hear in sensory cortices. Then that goes onwards to parietal regions and premotor regions. Now, under some circumstances, uh, the premotor region can then really produce a motor output that, that can um, um, be something like uh, imitation. And that's something that you, you can see in, uh, in animals as well in some cases. So what you would see here, for instance, is an, uh, one chimpanzee that has become quite good at cracking nuts with a big rock. And here there's a juvenile uh, male chimpanzee that also likes to eat nuts, but hasn't found out yet how to crack them. And, but he's looking very attentively at what the, the, the big guy is doing. What I want you to do is just focus on what uh, the observer will do with his hand while observing the action uh, of the expert. So you see he's really just rendering this uh, motor activity visible by moving his hand himself. So while he gets more interested in his own pair of nuts, which is a frequent behavior in chimpanzees, but for a while you could see how under certain circumstances this premotor activity can lead to overt motor output. But uh, under typical conditions, you can observe without imitating because you, you have a gating mechanism that prevents this premotor simulation to really go out into primary motor in, in your own body. But if we you know, observe as neuroscientists that you have these, um, these neurons in these brain regions responding to, to the sight and the sound of other people's actions, you may wonder how do we come to actually have mirror neurons? Now, you could imagine that they're all pre-wired by evolution, but that's a little bit unlikely given that we, in, um, for instance, had the example of the sound of someone opening a Coca-Cola can, activating the premotor cortex of people. I think it's unlikely that the evolution has equipped us with specific neurons for that purpose. So one of the ways that we in the lab are, are thinking of how we actually develop mirror neurons is linked to the concept of happy and learning. So I briefly remind you of what happy and learning is, and then I'll, I'll have a quick look at two temporal uh, levels at which we can look at that. There's a, a kind of macro temporal uh, level and, and a finer grain temporal level that we're going to look through. So uh, what uh, do we mean with happy and learning? So happy and learning uh, by in Hap's term itself was the fact that if you have two neurons A and B that are connected, then when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite the cell B and repeatedly and persistently takes part in firing cell B, 
then A's efficiency is one of the cells firing, B is increased. So that has sometimes been paraphrased at what fires together, wires together, but that's of course uh, slightly wrong because uh, Hab's point was that A has to participate in triggering activity in cell B. And of course, if they fire at the same time, A couldn't have been the cause for the firing in cell B. And actually kind of modern neuroscience has shown that what is really critical is that cell A has to fire just a little bit before cell B, then synaptic strength is increased. If it fires at the same time or just afterwards, then the synaptic activity is actually decreased. Okay, but now we have a mechanism and kind of uh, if we zoom out, we can say cells that often fire together will wire together. And if we look uh, more at the millisecond scale, we can see that uh, kind of a cell that fires just before another one will likely to, to start to connect. So what does that mean? So let's imagine we, we have a baby, or we could imagine as well that we have a robot here that, uh, that is starting to find out about its own uh, motor system. So let's imagine baby or robot just has two motor programs. Let's say a red one that makes baby grasp and a yellow one that makes baby throw things away. So if baby just tries out, activates some of its neurons, what will happen is that baby will grasp something in the environment. And here you see my firstborn daughter grasp for the second time in her life. And what you'll notice is how she's actually staring at her own hand while she's doing that. So that means that now you have this image of a hand grasping, entering baby's visual system and activating certain neurons that have uh, visual properties that are encoding this site. Now, if we imagine that at birth, the random connections between uh, these sensory neurons and the motor ones, then uh, we, we have here two very different situations from a Habian point of view. The input onto this cell will find a cell that is in an active state and will increase synaptic strength. This one will, will meet kind of a non-active cell and will decrease synaptic uh, strength. So after baby sees itself grasp for a couple of times, we've now wired here a connection that means that if baby now sees someone else grasp and grasping enters the sensory system, it now has selected through self-observation the right connections to create a mirror neuron here, so to activate its own motor program. And that wasn't pre-wired, but it's simply the result of the opportunity to see itself grasp and to realize that grasping visually is the same as grasping when you perform it. Now, um, one question is, of course, uh, is that uh, just speculation, or can we see that uh, adults, for instance, can start to wire sensory input to their own motor system. So one way we've done this is to look at uh, piano playing, because uh, a lot of people have never played the piano, and we can then play them back a very simple kind of keyboard melody like this. And if you do that with someone that has never played the piano themselves, you can put them in the scanner and you'll realize that they only activate their auditory cortices here. Now the reason this piano melody is so simple is that we can teach them to play the same melody in just five hours of training. And then what you do during those five hours of training is that they realize when they press certain keys, they can hear certain tunes. And you do that for five hours, uh, giving the brain this opportunity to pair the motor program with what it sounds like. And if after five hours of the training, you scan them again with this uh, piano music, now you see activity in the premotor cortex as well. So in just five hours, you stop to just listen with your ears and you start to listen with your own finger representations yourself. Now, this, of course, in the beginning, I told you about uh, Habian learning as being something that's exquisitely sensitive to whether an input precedes uh, the, the motor activity. 
And now I've been speaking very generally about things happening more or less at the same time. So if we zoom into the time a little bit more, imagine a baby is now learning to reach and grasp an object. So that's a little sequence, reaching, grasping. So it starts by doing the reaching part that will um, move its body that takes uh, some 500 or 100 milliseconds. Then it can see itself reaching then enters the brain that takes another one or 200 milliseconds. And 300 milliseconds later, what the, the motor cortex is actually doing, it, it's done with the reaching part. And it's now actually programming the next part, which is the grasping. So that if you look at this finer temporal scale, what, uh, what really would be happily uh, reinforced is not so much reaching to reaching, but reaching to grasping. And what that means is that now you've actually trained up a system that does anticipation. So that means now you've wired up the system so that the visual input of reaching is connected to the following motor program of grasping. Now you may wonder what would something like this be good for? So now I'd like you to, to actually turn on your, your cameras and your, and your microphones, and we'll do a, a very simple experiment. Okay. So I, I usually do this in a mini experiment live, so it's going to be interesting to see how it performs with the delays of, uh, uh, of Zoom. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play back a sound of clapping, and all you have to do is to clap together with the sound I'm presenting. So get your hands ready and try to clap along. You're not very good at this, are you? <laughs> <laughs> now, let, let's try again. But this time, uh, I'm going to lead. Just try to clap with me. OK, that's better already. There's some uh, Zoom delays. But it's a lot easier to clap along when you see me clapping. And the reason for that is that actually because it takes the brain 300 milliseconds to go from a sensory stimulus to programming a clapping action and to clap, when all you had to work with was the sound of the clapping playback, you were actually terribly delayed relative to that. Whereas if you see me clapping, you can anticipate the moment where the sound will actually be produced through the kind of system that your brain can wire up by just experiencing its own movement. And through that, you can actually compensate those sensory motor delays and actually act in synchrony with the world. So what, uh, what we think really happens here is that by wiring up through these happy mechanism, you can anticipate the actions of others long enough to be ready to plan an appropriate action uh, to, to respond to it, despite the sensory motor delays in your system. Can and I for ask the you a question. Yes, by all means. So this is a point to it. When you did the experiment with the clapping first with sound, it wasn't clear to me whether you were wanting us to respond as quickly as possible after the sound, or whether you were wanting us to already begin to anticipate the sound. Now, to anticipate the sound, obviously, it helped a lot when we saw you doing it and with these time delays. But would you get the same kind of en entrainment of these areas just by hearing the rhythm of the sound repeatedly so you can anticipate? Because yes. So, yes. So, so, you're perfectly right. So, if you have a predictable sequence, people can actually start to, to predict the sequence and act in real time. So that's uh, something that is well studied in, uh, in, uh, in kind of uh, music, because there, if you have two pianists kind of doing, say, jazz impro together, they can actually respond um, um, with zero delays 
to the, the key presses of someone else. But uh, we, we know that when, uh, when the sequences become more complex, then musicians actually need to see each other to be able to really lock onto each other's timing. And this is where, where these kind of uh, predictive coding loops really come to, to bear. Thank you very much. Very good explanation. So for the aficionados, we know that the brain doesn't only have feed-forward connections, there's also feedback connections that actually uh, send back a prediction of the, the movement that uh, inhibits predicted consequences in the sensory cortices. So if you then actually see what you were expecting the grasping to happen, your visual system is actually dampened in its response to that, and your brain doesn't need to, to process this predicted sensory income anymore, which is something that, of course, in, uh, in artificial control systems is routinely used. And it's something that we have seen in a number of experiments really happen in the brain. So you can both see anticipatory responses and you see attenuations of expected uh, responses uh, in the brain. Now, I hope that uh, with this uh, kind of Hebbian perspective, of course, it's not a very detailed mechanistic account, but I think it is useful in, uh, in getting us to, to think a little bit about the fact that what uh, initially seemed a really surprising finding that the brain would map um, sensory consequences onto motor program is actually a natural consequence of the fact that sensory motor regions are wired together for motor control and that through Hebbian learning you would automatically discover these contingencies between what you do and what it looks like and that would then naturally prepare you to, you know, to activate similar motor systems when you observe the, the actions of others. So, in a way, I hope this demystifies a little bit this concept. Now, I'm going to switch now to some of the emotional work we've done. Then uh, there'd be a lot of other uh, kind of motor studies as well, but I think it's a, it's a domain that I'm really excited about uh, right now that I'd like to share with you. So very early on, already in 2003, we were interested in, in understanding whether what we saw in the motor system also applies to emotions. And uh, so the first experiments we did uh, were using an anesthesia mask on people's face. And I ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? But the point is that if you want to study the motor system, you can put someone in the scanner and ask them to move their hand for 10 seconds and you get uh, great images of brain activity in the motor system. If you put someone in the scanner and you ask them to be sad or scared for 10 seconds, it's a lot more difficult. So we need to, to kind of help people to induce these emotions. And with the anesthesia mask, what we could do is we could uh, puff really pleasant smells into the anesthesia mask to, to evoke pleasant emotions, or, and it was a bit more effective, we, we puffed very unpleasant smells into that anesthesia mask, like for fur market pan that smells like rotten eggs. And that worked really well. So we had to take one subject out because they started vomiting in the scanner. But for the other ones, we could measure and uh, repeatedly uh, activity in the brain when they um, have an intense negative uh, physical feeling of, of disgust. And that's the area here in uh, red in the anterior insula. Then we show them movies of other people going through unpleasant uh, gustatory experiences. And we found that uh, this region here in blue was active where they simply observe the, the emotions of others, showing this kind of this overlap at the level of brain regions between seeing an emotion and feeling that emotion. Now, the other emotion we could reliably kind of induce is pain, because we can kind of put people in the scanner and we just slap them on the hand, that works nicely, and uh, if we do that, we find again activity in the anterior insula, and uh, we, we can then also show them um, movies of other people experiencing uh, pain, for instance, through a little electroshock on the hand. And we found, again, this overlap between uh, feeling the emotion and observing the emotion there. Now, for pain, there's uh, also another brain region that is a bit more specific for pain 
here in the cingulate that's uh, active both when you experience the pain and when you observe it. And under certain conditions, when you don't just see the facial expression, but you actually see in where on the skin uh, people are being slapped, then you also find this overlap in the somatosensory regions. Now, these early fMRI results uh, led to a lot of speculation. And uh, the, the speculation were mainly the idea that what seems to happen, the reason we empathize with the emotions of others is because our brain basically activates the very neurons involved in our own emotions while we witness those of others. Now, one question that we, that we had was, well, if that really happens, how old is such a system? Would we share it with the animal? So would rats, for instance, have a similar system? And while we did this kind of um, more evolutionary question, we could as well uh, go beyond what we can do in humans and ask ourselves, well, what would happen if we zoom into one of these brain regions, the cingulate, for instance? Would we find that it contains two separate populations of neurons, one uh, responding to my pain and one responding to your pain? Or would we uh, find that within that region, you'd have some neurons that really respond to my pain and to your pain? And I think those would be two very different situations. Because in this case, you would really see that there is a mechanism in the brain where at some level, feeling pain and observing pain is the same thing. In this case, you wouldn't have evidence for that at all because brain regions do many different things. And the fact that two functions are localized in the same brain region doesn't mean that there is a crosstalk between these neural populations. But this is a difference that we could never really make in humans and that we need animal models for. And the second really important question that has been plaguing the, the mirror neuron literature for a really long time is that we speculate about the fact that activity in these populations is what makes you feel bad when you see this Syrian boy. And perhaps as well that it's them that make you want to do something for that person. But in humans, we can't really manipulate the activity in these regions. And therefore, this remains a speculation. But if we go in animals, we can start to really manipulate brain activity and see whether that would influence you know, sharing and pro-social action. So those have really been some of the aims we, we have had more recently. Now, the first question, do animals share the emotions of others? Now, there what we did was we, you know, we focused on, on rats as a model because uh, rats actually live in groups. They, they live uh, in nature, often in groups of up to 30 um, rats. Uh, a bit like human hunter-gatherers uh, are thought to, to have done in the past. So we figured they have a, a tight kind of social interactions. They might be a, a good model. And the, the way that we studied here uh, emotional uh, transmission was similar to the human experiment where we, for instance, slap one person on the hand and see what happens in the brain of the observer. So what we do here is we put two rats face to face and then we, we apply a little uh, foot shock on one of the grids. So, so you would see the, the rat that gets it, that really gets a bit startled and is wondering what's happening to my paws here. They give out a little squeak of surprise and they freeze. So that's a, a natural reaction in rodents when, they, when they're scared or startled, they stop completely to move, which in nature helps them not to be detected by predators. But our question was, how would the observer react? Would they perhaps also get uh, a bit scared? And would they therefore also start to freeze? So here what you see is in red, the freezing of the demonstrator, uh, when from the baseline period, they get these five little foot shocks. And you see the demonstrator really starts to freeze a lot, up to 80% of the time. What we see in the observer, is a significant freezing to come up despite nothing happening to the observer. But we figured, okay, well, foot shocks for this observer are probably something that's very abstract. A rat has never felt what it feels like, which makes it very difficult for them perhaps 
to to uh, to get an understanding for what happens in the other. So in the, in the second group, what we did was a couple of days before they witnessed the other one get these little foot shocks, we give them a couple of little foot shocks themselves. And then kind of days later, they're no longer scared for themselves, but they see what happens to, to the other. And what you see in that condition, the observer will start not in the baseline, but as soon as, uh, as it observes the other one get foot shocks, you start to get very high levels of freezing, showing that really the, the fear of the demonstrator was transmitted to the observer, much like what we observe in, in humans as well. Now, you remember in the part on actions, we speculated a bit about the fact that mirror neurons might uh, really wire up because you can see your own hand actions. Well, so we figured that what actually happens here is that in the days before, when we had the observer experience a couple of foot shocks uh, themselves, what happens is that they emit these little uh, squeaks of, of surprise. So that means that while they get the foot shocks themselves, two things happen. One is that they experience the, uh, this uh, little uh, pain on the paw themselves and they emit these squeaking sounds. So that means that from a happy point of view in their brains, you'll have simultaneously activity of the uh, auditory representation of a squeak and the first hand experience of, of fear and, and pain, meaning that the two things could wire together so that later on, if we would just play back squeaks, perhaps we would be able to reactivate the inner state that they remember from their own experience. And indeed, we did the playback experiment in which we just play back the sound of squeaks to, uh, to an observer alone in the dark. And we see that when they have experienced foot shocks themselves in the past, they'll start to freeze now without needing to see what happens to the other simply by, by hearing the squeak playback. And that's uh, not true so much uh, if they haven't experienced foot shocks themselves. This is also interesting because sometimes in animals, you, you wonder whether the transmission of fear is due to pheromones, which are these, uh, uh, these odorants uh, that they can emit when they're stressed. But the fact that it works even just with playback of a sound shows that it's more similar to, to what we experience as, as humans as well. But of course, you might wonder, we see that, uh, that a rodent can get scared when, when it witnesses another one get scared. We know that we humans can get scared when we see people scared around us. But is there anything in common between uh, what the, the rodent experience and what we experience? Now, it's not easy to know because we never know what a rodent really feels. The one thing we can do, especially as neuroscientists, is we can see whether there are similarities in what happens in the brain. And if we believe that the brain is what is causing the experience, then similar brain activity may speak towards similar experiences. Now, in humans, as I told you, one thing we know is that the, the cingulate cortex is really important when we witness the pain of others. So we figured, well, that's good because uh, the rat has an area, area 24, that is the direct homologue to, to the brain area that's involved in empathy in humans. And with homologue, we mean here that it really comes from a common ancestor, has a similar connectivity. So we figured what would happen if we would just deactivate what we know to be the human empathy brain regions in a rat and uh, repeat this experiment. So we, we will inject Massimo, which is a kind of a, a neurosuppressant, into the, the kind of corresponding area in the rat, in the observer. And we see how much they freeze when they witness their friend get uh, a couple of foot shocks. So if we inject just uh, salty water that doesn't do anything, we see this strong reaction, 80% freezing in the observer. But if we deactivate this human empathy region in the rat, we saw that they now no longer start to freeze when they witness the other one freeze, showing that there's really a similarity in the brain regions involved. And also for the first time, we can now really show that these brain regions 
that are associated with mirroring actually necessary for the ability to share emotions of others. A, a cute effect that we observed was that if you look at how much the demonstrators freeze based on whether you suppress the empathy region in the observer, we found that in, in demonstrators paired with the observers that didn't freeze so much actually themselves freeze a little bit less as well, which is something that is sometimes described as social buffering, which means that even your own experiences are influenced by how you see others react to them. And we can see that uh, in, the, in the human as well. So here I've just talked about one of these brain regions, but other labs have shown that a number of the other brain regions involved in empathy in human are also necessary for this emotional transmission in rats, which is really, um, I think, a testimony for the fact that these basic mechanisms seem to have a long evolutionary history. Now, one of the questions we had, of course, is, is it just the same brain region or is it the same neurons involved when you see pain and when you feel pain? So here we could again use our rat, and now we record from single neurons in this uh, human empathy region in the rat. And we can do so either while the rat that, is, uh, that we're recording from is experiencing an unpleasant sensation. So here we use a, a little red light that we can shine on the paw and it creates a sensation of heat that is uh, unpleasant. And if we do that, we see that the, the, the neurons in the cingulate increase their activity to this uh, painful heat laser. We see that at the level of the population and here in a single neuron over 10 trials, we see this increase in firing. If we reduce the, you know, the, the magnitude of the laser to the point where it's warm but not painful, uh, these neurons don't respond, so they're really about pain. Now, if we don't do anything to the implanted animal, but do, do a couple of foot shocks again to, to an animal close by, the very same neurons respond to the same uh, amount by simply observing the pain of the other. If we reduce the, uh, the, the foot shock a little bit, where it's still painful, the response in the observer pain neurons go down a bit. And if we just uh, shock an empty grid without the animal, there's no response here. So this really shows kind of 20 years after we've done the, the fMRI experiments in humans, that if you zoom in, you can really see that the very neurons involved in an animal's own pain get reactivated when witnessing the pain of others. And it's a, a kind of quantitative readout. If you see someone experiencing a little bit of pain, you activate your pain neurons a little bit. If you see them experience more pain, you activate this more. And uh, we, we can show that uh, if it's not uh, known pain really of another animal, but we just uh, present a scary sound to the implanted animal without any pain involved, there's no response here. So it's not really just uh, something salient happening. It's really mapping the pain of another onto your own pain. So that leads us to, to thinking a bit, why is it that evolution actually creates a system that would make one animal scared when it witnesses another one in, in pain. And uh, in humans, when we think about empathy, we often think along a very pro-social line of thinking that empathy is there so that we feel for other people, that we help them. But uh, I think what the animals in the long evolutionary history invite us to, to consider is perhaps a simpler explanation. So imagine I have uh, two mice roaming around in my kitchen and uh, they, they try to find some cheese and in, uh, in Amsterdam sadly that's the reality. We have mice in most houses and now my cat uh, tiger comes into, into the room. Now one of these mice is in a situation where she can see the rat directly. So that one will, will hide and start to freeze. This one can't directly see the cat and then by itself would probably continue to, to roam around making some little scratching sounds, get discovered by the cat and possibly die. 
But because we've shown that uh, it actually has neurons that are sensitive to the freezing and distress of the other animal, it can start to freeze simply through this uh, emotional contagion, which means that it will now not be discovered by this cat either. In a way, it could prepare appropriate reactions without having had to see danger firsthand, but by using other individuals as kind of antennas for danger in the environment. Now, if the cat moves away, this guy can see this, can start to relax, can go about uh, to, uh, to find its cheese again. And as we've seen, if, uh, if you're around animals that are not as scared, you will start to relax a little bit again through emotional contagion. And so now this one can relax again and, and start to, to look for, for its own cheese. So I think that what we, we are thinking more and more in the lab is that actually the ability to share emotions with others may have um, evolved for a very simple selfish purpose, which is the fact that you can use others to sense dangers or to sense opportunities in your environment without needing to run the risk of finding out about these dangers and predators firsthand. And then once you, you, you have this system, perhaps you can use it for other things as well, but um, primarily it allows you to adapt your behavior to the environment more effectively. Now, the next question uh, that was really salient uh, in, um, uh, in, in theorizing is this notion that there is a link between sharing emotions and your will to actually do something for others. In philosophy, that really goes back to, to Adam Smith. They were saying that the only reason we don't hurt other people is because when we hurt other people, we share their pain. And that's uh, kind of giving us this intuitive, aversive feeling. And just like we avoid our own pain, we therefore will avoid to, to harm others. Now, in modern terms, we can ask ourselves, therefore, would these kind of mirror regions that seem to map the pain of others onto our own pain play a causal role in making us averse to, to harming others? And so then we, we turn again to, towards our little uh, rat friends and developed a, a paradigm in which rats have the opportunity to do something for others. So now we're going to focus on this rat here, and we give the rat two levers. So rats are curious, they try out one of the levers, they press it down, and they realize, oh, I get a lovely little pallet of sucrose. I like that. Let's check out the other lever. They press it down. They see, oh, this one's a bit harder to press. I need to press harder. But I also get one nice pallet of food. So most of them, after a while, kind of forget about the tough lever and focus on the easy lever that, that gives them the, the food they like. Once they've developed that preference, what we now do as a model of the fact that sometimes uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can get lovely things, but getting them means harming other people, we pair now the preferred lever with a little foot shock to the other guy. So now each time they get the easy sucrose palette, they hear their friend emitting a little pain squeak. If they try out the, the other lever, they also get food. They need to put in a bit more effort, but now their friend doesn't get a, a, a shock. Now, if rats actually care about other people, we would expect them to shift away from the easy lever to the harder level now to prevent harm to, to their friend. And that's actually what we observe. So if you look at the behavior, then the rats, both uh, male and female rats, initially have a preference for one of the lever. As soon as we pair it with shocks to the other, um, a lot of them will switch away from using the easy lever and their preference kind of disappears. Now, that is true actually in rats, whether they're in, uh, they really know the other rat very well or not. So that was uh, interesting. But uh, what we were interested in neuronally was what would happen if we would now deactivate the brain regions that contains the neurons that were mapping the pain of others onto their own. 
would that prevent the rats from switching away from the easy lever? So we, you know, we deactivated the singular the area 24 that's involved in the empathy in humans, and we saw that that's exactly what happened. So if we inject salt water that doesn't do anything, they switch away from their favorite lever. If we deactivate the cingulate, they now no longer switch away from their favorite lever, and they're quite happy to, to shock uh, the other animals just to, to get uh, easy food. Now, um, as a little interim uh, summary before we, we switch to, to uh, psychopathy and, and the control of empathy, what we've basically seen is that uh, already rats have a brain that seems to allow them to share uh, the distress of, of other rats. We've seen that the brain regions that are involved are the direct homologue to the brain regions involved in humans, showing that this ability to share emotions is at least 80 million years old, because that's when we separated uh, from the, the line that leads to, to rodents. So it's really quite an old system. And kind of, uh, we, we can see that it would be adaptive to have that just to sense dangers in the environment. But the good news is that it also appears to make harming others averse. So I'm not saying that the rat is switching because it doesn't want the friend to get shocks. It might be that it switches because it doesn't like how it feels to, uh, to, to share the distress of the other, which is slightly different, but uh, the, the basic result is still the same, that rats don't really harm others if they, they can avoid doing that through the system. And now um, I'll come to, to the final section of the talk, uh, which is the question of whether these mechanisms just happen to us or whether we actually control how strongly they happen to us. And we actually came to this notion by studying psychopathic criminals. So the reason why we switch to psychopathic criminals uh, which are uh, individuals that have uh, committed uh, pretty violent crimes. So they've uh, sometimes murdered, sometimes uh, multiple rapes, and we, we get them out of uh, high security institutions. But what uh, sets them apart from, uh, from normal, let's say, criminals, is the fact that they don't really seem to, to experience much empathy for the victim. And they don't seem to have this, uh, this feeling of regret. So we figured perhaps they have an abnormal emotion sharing system in their brain. So we brought them in the scanner, we had them experience pain by slapping them uh, on the hand, and we had them uh, observe the pain of others. What we observed was that uh, while we were slapping these uh, multiple murderers on their hands to kind of teach them a lesson, we actually saw that their brain activity was very similar to that of our control participants. So it's not like they can't experience pain themselves. But when we had them view, for instance, someone twisting the finger of someone else or hitting someone else, we saw very different brain activities. So the controls activate kind of the motor mirror regions that we talked about in these cases and the emotional ones. Uh, the psychopathic criminals activated them much less. If we did the direct comparison, so if we looked how strongly their reactivate region involved in their own emotions, we saw that uh, they activate kind of all of these regions we've been talking about less. So that's true for reduced motor, somatosensory, uh, and as well uh, emotional brain region. So our first conclusion was, well, perhaps that they indeed have a kind of broken mirror system, they don't share the pain of others so much. But then we figured, let's scan them again this time, but this time we'll ask them to really to try to empathize with what happened to the victims in the movie. And they said, oh yeah, sure, I can do that. And when they do that voluntarily, the brain activity was pretty much the same as that of uh, everybody else in that uh, experiment. And that told us, well, wait a second. So what seems to be going on in them is not that they're incapable of empathizing, but that they don't empathize so much spontaneously. 
So then we figured perhaps we have to change this notion that we had initially, that people, of course, vary in empathy. And we thought that you would have very empathic individuals up here on that scale and psychopath down here. We realized, well, wait a second, actually we need to think in two dimensions. We have one that captures how empathic you can be if you want to, and one that actually captures how empathic you are if you don't even try to be. And now we realize that actually a normal empathic individuals and psychopaths can actually have a similar ability to empathize, but have a different propensity to do that spontaneously. And once we started to think about that, we figured, well, that really does make sense because there are moments in life where it's actually not good to empathize. So imagine you, your kid did something wrong and you have to punish your kid. If you really empathize with the distress you're gonna cause your, your kid, you're never gonna be able to do what you really wanna do, which is help them to, to become better. So you have some times to suppress your empathy and we now more and more realize that all these systems, we regulate all the time in our brain. So uh, we, uh, we and others have done experiments, for instance, where we show people the pain of someone that they consider part of the in-group or someone that they consider part of their out-group. And if we just measure in the singulate, we see, and in the insula, we see big differences in the activity. You basically down-regulate the system when you see someone that you consider not to be your friend receive the pain. We've also seen that when you feel responsible for the pain, you have much stronger activity than if you feel that it wasn't your fault. And we also have shown now that you can just uh, show people, say a Hollywood movie, and you ask them to either turn their empathy on or turn it off, and they can do that and really manipulate the level of activity in all of these brain regions. So I think we, we, we've shown you now in this talk, on the one hand, that our brain is really wired to be able to share the actions and the emotions of others. And that's something that's deep in our biology. We can see it in monkeys for the actions, we can see it in rats for the emotions. But I've also shown you that although this is deep in our biology, we can actually control it up and down based on the situations that we're in. And I think that's really important uh, if we think about uh, whether empathy is something that's good for us as humans or not. Because there's, a, on the one hand, a lot of research that has emphasized uh, all the positive aspects of being able to, to share the emotions of others. So, so there are studies to show that people that share emotions tend to be happier, they have more friends, they're in their, their partners are more satisfied in their, their relationships, they tend to be less aggressive, so they, they bully less in schools, they're better leaders kind of in teams, they're better doctors, so and people that have a more empathic uh, doctor feel better afterwards, they're more creative in groups and they're more pro-social. But there are other studies that have also shown that empathy isn't always good. So, uh, for instance, uh, people have, have shown that it's a, it's a problem, of course, that we empathize so much more for our in-group than our out-group, because that can lead us sometimes to really do and um, become quite aggressive towards uh, other groups, which we see right now in, in conflicts around the world. Another problem with empathy is that it's not really good at numbers. So if you see one person suffer or 1,000 people suffer, you don't have 1,000 times more brain activity in your singulate. And therefore, when you have to make difficult decisions about saving one person and, um, for, uh, or 1,000 people, the system doesn't really help you very much. And uh, there's also uh, issues with, uh, with understanding and with, with the fact, like I was saying, that uh, when you need to do certain things, empathy can get uh, in the way. So if you imagine a surgeon that needs to cut a leg off to help someone, if you're, you're really empathic while you do that, you're not gonna be a very good uh, 
uh, surgeon. And so the, the bottom line of that is that some people try to argue that empathy is good or bad, but what I would like you to take back is actually the fact that the good news is that we, we have it in our brain to be empathic, which means that we can get all of these good things, and we have it in our system to actually downregulate empathy if we need to, and that can help us to, to avoid all of these negative things if we learn to, to know when to turn empathy on and when to turn it off. And uh, now I'd like to, to thank uh, all the people that have made that work possible, kind of uh, foremost uh, Valeria Gazzola, with whom I, I lead the lab together, and she's also my, my wife, and we've done most of these experiments together. This is our lab during social distancing at the beach, and that's uh, a bit more recent. And uh, these are some of the, the PhDs in postdoc that unfortunately are no longer with, uh, with our lab, but they've gone on to, to, to exciting careers. And then uh, I'd like to thank the, the funders. And if you, you want some light reading about some of the things I, I've talked about, there's uh, also a, a book that's perhaps more suited for people that are really not in the, uh, in the field and don't want to read uh, the detailed neuroscience uh, papers but that uh, are interested in, in the overall concept. So thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, I'd be happy to take on uh, any questions. And uh, feel free to ask them in French or, or in English. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm bilingual. Thank you very much, Christian, for an extremely interesting talk and provocative. Um...